Lord, we come to you, God, as broken people. Lord, you make us whole. You can us, Lord. Help us give it back to you this morning. It's because we celebrate a God who changes lives. 
and he is actively at work here, right now, and you are here for a reason. God has brought you here for a purpose, and he has a plan for your life, and I believe that he is here to meet you in your deepest need and your darkest hour or your greatest moment. He is here to be with you today, and I thank you, uh, Jesus, for that promise. Um, we're glad you're here. A couple of announcements. I hope as you walked in the door, you grabbed a, a bulletin. There are most of everything you need to know is there. One thing I want to uh, say that is not in there that will be there next week, I believe, to remind you all, our Thanksgiving dinner is going to be two weeks from today. So it'll be Sunday night. Our normal gathering time on Sunday evening. We'll have instead a Thanksgiving meal in the fellowship hall. Everyone's invited. Bring your friends and family. We'll have a big feast together two weeks from today, Sunday evening. Um, also, let me point out our Operation Christmas Child. All this coming week, drop-off time is at First Baptist Church in, in Dayton. You can drop off your boxes. If you need more, I've got plenty more right here. Come up after the service and grab one or grab one during our greeting time in just a moment. There are also some uh, nifty uh, how to pack a shoebox brochures here that gives you all the instructions on how to do that. That's one of the ways, church, we're reaching out to the end of the world. Amen? It's one of the ways that we're sharing Jesus with others. Uh, you may not meet them personally today, but won't it be cool one day in heaven? It won't be one day where someone comes running up to you and says, Hey, you know what? I began a relationship with Jesus when I received something from you. What an awesome, awesome, awesome privilege it is to be able to serve our Lord, who is with us not only now, but for all eternity. And uh, I want you to be a part of this, so come up and grab a box uh, at your convenience. I believe that's all in the way of announcements. Let us, uh, let us bow our heads and go to God in prayer, and then we're going to greet one another, okay? Dear Jesus, we love you today. Lord, you do bless us. God, it, it, just the, the beautiful morning we get to wake up to, this beautiful fall day, thank you for it. Thank you for this place that we can gather and in your name. Thank you for uh, all the ways in which you are leading us and teaching us us and speaking into our lives, God. May we not be deaf to the way that you are speaking today. May we have open hearts, open eyes, Lord, to see you at work. God, if there be anything in our, in our, in our lives right now that might serve as a distraction from what you want to do in this hour we are together, God, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you would uh, bind it up and and, and dispel it and, and cast it out of here, cast it out of our, our minds, Lord, so that we would give you freely everything that is within us. That we would offer you, Lord, our very selves, and that you would even now begin to heal us and bind us and put us back together for your glory and your service. Jesus, we love you. Continue to give us vision. Continue to give us passion for the those in our community, Lord, who right now don't know you. God, help us to be uh, people who reach out to the least and the last, the lost and the lonely in our midst, God. And give us a fire in our hearts, God, to reach those who don't know the name of Jesus yet. Father, we confess our great need for you. Fill this place with your spirit. And for all of this, we'll give you thanks. In Jesus' great name we pray, and all of God's people agree by saying, Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to stand and turn.
this time and uh, I've struggled for four years and, and I've walked into a lot of good churches a lot of good people there and I just felt like it's not it it's, it's not God and and I've even got angry with him you know you get angry with God but you don't want him to know you're angry with him so you just kind of keep praying God when, I'm, when is this going to happen I'm waiting I trust you and I'm very much a Martha. I got to be servant wherever I'm at. And I felt such a loneliness, so much like I was gone. And then a few weeks ago, I walked in that door, and I've just felt peace and I felt hope. And and you're beautiful, wonderful people. But I walked into a lot of churches, a lot of beautiful, wonderful people. And so this week, when I was doing my my devotion. I asked God, I said, what was different? For four years, I've been begging you 
to bring this to me? What's been different? And he said, I wanted you hungry to be in my will. He said, I let you desire this for four years so that when you walk into the place I'm preparing for you to serve and to live among those people, that you'll be hungry for it and grab it and do it with all your heart. And so I thank you for welcoming me into your family and I just praise God for his faithfulness because when we're in his will, there's peace and love beyond description. Thank you. Amen. You didn't pass out. It's <laughs> close. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. I think we got some kids in the house. Yeah, they are. <laughs> if you're young or young at heart, I want to invite you to come on down and uh, we'll have a little time together before you go to Children's Church, okay? Ashley, you were the bearer. Oh, that's heavy. What in the world? Awesome. Come on down. Anyone else? Don't be shy. All right. Let me see if I can sit down here. I went bowling last night and realized I'm 40 years old and my back hurts. <laughs> Goodness. I only bowled one game. And I'm... Yeah, all right. So... If I don't get back up, someone's going to have to come and help me here. So, how y'all doing? Good. Y'all look so great. It's great. Good, good week at school. Yeah. Yeah, I had a great week at school, Pastor. Yeah, I learned so much. And it's fun to learn. All right, let's see what we got this week. This, if, if you're new with us, every week someone different gets to take this home. We call it What's in the Box, but it's really a, a book, isn't it? It's a hollow book. There's nothing inside. Well, it's hollow, and then someone takes it home and puts something in it and brings it back on Sunday, and I don't have any idea what's in it. So we open it up, and we, we look, and we try to connect it to a story in the Bible, right? Let's see. Oh. It's a plaque. An award. Is this an award? For Ashlyn, right? Is this your team award? Let's see. The Tennessee Force. Yeah? I'm going to guess that's basketball because I see basketball court lines on there. Yeah? Um, and all these other names on it. Who, who's Macy Spud? <laughs> and Ansley Gonzo. Who are you hanging out with, Ashlyn? <laughs> Those are nicknames. Why don't you have a nickname? It's not to be tall girl. Tall girl. That's that suits you. Yeah. So guys, you all see this? This is a. Um, this is from the what, last year's season. Yeah. For basketball, you guys see that? And it's got. Are those all members of your team? Here, I'll let, give that to you. I don't want to drop it. So that's really nice. Um, did, what did you did you win that for any any kind of uh, the whole team got one and what I notice about that is that your your name is one on how many other names are there one two three four five sixteen names so you got you got a team of people there right and do you guys have you ever tried to do something by yourself and and it's really really hard yeah I, a lot of times, I, my kids come and ask me, like, Dad, can you get the, the juice down in the fridge because it's on the top shelf and they can't reach it? Or, or as someone did last night, they did do it by themselves, but they left the milk out all night. And when Dad woke up this morning, the milk was laying out on the counter with no lid on top. Uh, I'm getting off subject. Sorry. <laughs> so, that was... Um, so... Um, but, but, you know, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, it says two are better than one because you get a, a, a better return for your work. So that's in Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament. But all throughout the Bible, Jesus tells us, you know what, you can't do this without me. And one of the cool things about being on a team like Ashlyn, like you're on, is you're learning. When, is anyone else on a team, a sports team? Some of you are. Yeah. 
or you might be one day. And one of the cool things you learn about being on a team is that you need other people, right? You need each other. And together, if Ashlyn was the only one on the court, that would be a bad day, right, Ashlyn? You may be awesome and you are a tall girl, but, but uh, if it's one against the whole other team of five, you're going to have a hard day. But we need each other. And that's also like the church. You know, we need one another. Look, look out over here. Look over all these folks over here. See all them looking at you? Yeah. And you guys look back at them? Yeah? Let's have this awkward moment for just a second. Okay? <laughs> yeah. So we need each other. And everyone here needs someone else. We all need a person. We need, a, we need that, that body of, of people, like a team, to go through life. And, and Jesus, the great thing about this is we're never, ever alone. Jesus promises to be with us all the time. He'll never leave us or forsake us. You always, even when you feel like you're alone out there, you know that Jesus is with you. And he, he is he's in your heart. He goes with you wherever you go, right? So uh, I, I hope you all remember that uh, being together on a team is a good thing. We need each other, and that's okay. That's all right to need each other. All right? I'm going to pray for you all, and I pray you have a great week at school. And I can't wait to see you next week. And uh, we'll do this again. Uh, Where's uh, uh, Dwayne and Monica? We'll dismiss. We'll, you'll follow them out for Children's Church here in a moment. Anyone who wants to go with them, you can go. Hold on one second. What? Not yet. Let, let's have a word of prayer, though, okay? Can you bow your heads? All right. Dear Jesus, we love you. Thank you for each of these children here. Thank you for their homes and their families. Thank you for those who brought them here today. I pray that you would bless them. I pray, God, that uh, each of these kids here today would know that you love them and are with them and that they're never alone, that uh, they are part of a team and that they are part of a church that loves them and cares for them and is praying for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, oh, okay. All the lost and lonely All the thieves will come confess
set us up for all kinds of issues in life, don't they? Our expectations of what life ought to be really, really put put us in in a place, in a predicament where, where we might feel like we're not getting what we deserve or others aren't getting what they should get or they deserve. And we have these expectations that we put on not just uh, others, but we put them on ourselves too, what we think others think of us, right? We have expectations that we feel that you have about me. I have expect I have stuff that I'm sure maybe none of you ever thought about, but I put them on myself and I carry those around. We have expectations that we carry of other people. Maybe you were raised in an environment where you had to do everything perfect growing up, or you got into some kind of trouble. Maybe you were uh, raised in an environment where you know a B was not good enough. It had to be an A. It had to be perfect. And, and if you got anything less, you felt less than. Maybe you grew up in a church, in a church culture, where you had to get everything right, and you had to look a certain way, and dress a certain way, and act a certain way, and speak a certain way. And, and if you didn't do all of those things, then you got that look. You know? Or worse yet, you got the boot. We have these expectations. We grow up living under these intense pressures of the expectations that others have on us. And in turn, we have expectations. We have expectations of others of how we think they ought to live. So long as we are, as, as other people are living up to my expectations, then, then I'm happy, right? So long as others are living up to my expectations and your expectations, then life is going on pretty routine and we kind of go on this uh, cruise control and just as long as everyone lives up to my expectations and things are good. But more often than not, how, how's that working for anyone? Now, more often than not, people will let us down in their, our expectations of them. More often than not, we won't get what we want or think we deserve. You might have expectations of your kids uh, that and it won't take more than five minutes for those to just go down and go. <laughs> yeah. I expect to wake up and be able to have a bowl of cereal with some milk. <laughs> this morning I wake up and find sour milk on my counter. And, uh, you know, we have expectations. You might, you might expect that your boss will recognize all the hard work you put in. You might expect that, you're, that they'll recognize that give you a raise or a promotion that you deserve. You might have expected that, you know, I'm 30 years old now or 40 years old or 50 or 60 and I should be at a certain place in my life. I have dreams and I have these things. I expected that I'd be at a different place than I am now. I'd be doing something different with my life than I am now and I'm not there. And so I'm, I'm kind of angry about that and I'm upset because my expectations of where I should be right now are, up, are upsetting me. Last night, I expected to bowl better than a hundred, and, uh, and I expected to be able to do it without throwing my lower back out. We have expectations. You have expectations of your spouse. Amen? Amen. Okay. How should we answer that? No. You do, though. When, when, when you were first planning to get married, you didn't have expectations of the person you were courting or dating, right? You didn't have expectations. You had dreams, right? You had desires. You had big plans of what our life was going to be like. You didn't have expectations. Remember, think back when you were dating your, 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 if you're married now or, or if you're dating right now, God bless you. And, uh, <laughs> but you're dating, you're, no, you're dating someone and, and you know, you're sitting, you, you have conversations that look like this. You know, no, honey, I, I don't mind waiting for you. <laughs> Every time I come to pick you up for a date, you're 15 or 20 minutes late. That doesn't bother me at all. I find it so adorable that you're getting dolled up for me and getting ready. It's so cute, honey. Hi, baby cakes. <laughs> so cute when you're late. No, every minute I get to sit in the car waiting for you is just a time for me to think of 60 things I love about you. <laughs> right? 
and you're at dinner, and, and she looks over at you, and she says, I, I love the way you, you, you chew your food so loudly. <laughs> it, it tells me that you enjoy my cooking, that you're really just loving this food. It's so manly. I love you, honey. You know, and then you get married, and it's not long before it's, hey, if you're not down here in 30 seconds, I'm leaving. You're sitting in the driveway honking the horn. Hurry up. We're going to be late. She looks over at you at dinner and goes, do I have to see and hear you eat? You sound like a horse. We have expectations. And when they're not met, we get upset. We have expectations of God, too, don't we? Don't we? God, I put in my time. God, I've showed up. I've kept my side of the plate clean. I, I showed up at church. every. I've got perfect attendance in Sunday school, God. I, I serve. I do all of this for you, God. I don't drink or cuss or chew or run with girls who do. You know? <laughs> God, this shouldn't be happening to me now. This is unfair. I don't deserve this. How could a loving God do this to me? If you really cared about me and God, you wouldn't allow me to go through this. I don't deserve it. And you see, the insanity of a certain argument, of that argument, it doesn't even dawn on us in those moments of deep suffering and hurt and pain or when our expectations aren't being met because we don't even recognize that Jesus, who is God's very own son, suffered for us and suffered and died for me. Yeah, he didn't enjoy it. Yeah, he, he, he wanted to see if there was another way out. Lord, if, if it's possible, if we can take this cup from me and we can do it this another way, then I'm all for that. But his ultimate aim was to please his Father and to say, you know what, this is the path i got to go through, so teach me everything you want me to know, God, in this moment. And the Bible tells us that Jesus learned obedience to his Father through the things he suffered. It was in his suffering that he turned his face towards God and said, where are you, and how can I learn something from this? Hebrews 5 tells us that while Jesus was yet on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears. You hear that? Jesus offering prayers and pleadings with loud cries and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. And then listen to this, what it says in Hebrews even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. So who am I, really, to ask God, why? I don't deserve this. Who am I? Life hurts. Life just hurts. The first line of Scott Peck's great book, The Road Less Traveled, begins with these three words. Life is hard. Amen? Amen. It is true. Life is hard. It hurts. The fact that Jesus, God's own son, went through hurt, went through pain, even death on a cross, it convicts me deeply when I'm in my own moments of self-pity and it cries out to me and says, Chad, your expectations are out of whack. They're out of whack, Chad. And you gotta, you got to get back <coughs> in focus here. Get back in line. You are human. And therefore, you're going to hurt. That, that, is, that is just our, what, where we are. We live in a world that is hurting. Jesus promised it. He said, in this life, you will have trouble. But take heart, he says. Why? Because I've overcome the world. But he guaranteed trouble. He guaranteed hurt. So what I need is not, not to escape from that hurt, but I need to recognize that my expectations need to change, and I need to have a change of how I see life. There has to be a change that happens inside of Chad Holtz. There has to be a change that happens inside of each and every one of us. We need to 
change how we see the world. It's not a safe place. And you know what? It's also not my final home. It's not, it's not the end game. It's not the end of it all. But man, if you don't know that today, then, then this life can get really depressing. You know? This life can be very, very hard if this is all there is for us to hope for. In fact, Paul says it this way, one of Jesus' first followers. He says, if our hope is in Christ and only this life, then we're more to be pitied than anyone. Than anyone in the world. And it's so important that we get what Paul's saying here. Because he's saying, to be intimately connected with Jesus, to be intimately connected with the King of Kings, is to say that I am empowered to realize that whatever hurt happens here, whatever suffering I do here, I don't do it alone. I don't do it by myself. But the one who suffered with me, the one who suffers alongside of me, he is with me every step of the way, and I can develop this eternal perspective that this is not all there is. But if all I got is this, if all we got is this, we die and that's it, then I have much to be upset about. Then, then my whole life is about pursuing happiness here, right? Everything must be about how can I get happy here? How can I find my true happiness now? And we begin pursuing that again and again and again, up against everyone's expectations of ourselves and the expectations we have of others. And it's really hard to get happy in that kind of setting, isn't it? How's that working for you? If you're just pursuing happiness day in and day out, how's that working for you? So I ask myself in times of trouble, I ask myself, am I pursuing in this moment happiness? Or am I pursuing to become more like Christ? Am I pursuing holiness? Am I pursuing Christ-likeness? I can continue trying to pursue happiness, which usually means that everyone around me has to meet my expectations, and they have to line up with what I think everyone should be doing, and then I'm happy. Or I can change that view. So what is God showing me here? You know, the moment my wife or my kids or my church or my friends or my God, they fail to meet my expectations, I become unhappy, and very easily I can fall into those traps of playing the victim. You know that person? It's inside of all of us, right? That victim. If your goal is happiness and other people aren't making you happy, then it's natural to just fall into that victim mentality of, Woe is me. Everyone's out against me. I can't get what I want. And so we begin to medicate. We self-medicate. That's what you do when, when you're trying to find happiness and can't get it. When you feel like the victim, you self-medicate with whatever's around. It might be, for some it's, it's drink, or, or drugs, or sex, or food. It might be TV, or video games. It might be an online chat room. It might be online anything. <coughs> Just a way to escape. It might be somebody else's spouse. It might be your spouse. It might be your kids. It might be your grandkids. It could be religion. It could be anything where we self-medicate and try to get away from the pain of people not meeting our expectations. And this is why those are so dangerous. Because for a little bit they work, right? They, they actually kind of work for a little while. They get our minds off of the pain that we're feeling right now. They get our minds off the, the stuff that's going on in our life, and, and they make us forget. And for a brief moment we feel good about ourselves. But it's dangerous because it doesn't address the disease. It hides and masks the symptoms, but it doesn't address the disease. My daughter keeps getting, my youngest daughter, Ava, keeps getting sore throats. And so we take her to the doctor, and, and you know, they give her amoxicillin and so forth, and, um, you know, we give her some medicine to help numb her throat or something. That you, if you're older, you might take some Luden's cough drops or something like that. But, but until, 
until we, we take her tonsils out, until we operate and take those tonsils out which are causing all of this, she's going to continue getting sore throats and continue getting strep throat, and the medicine is just going to kind of mask all of that for a little while. You and I need to recognize that we have a disease as well. And the fact that life hurts, that stuff happens, is evidence that we live in a world that's sick. We live in a fallen world. We live in a world with strep throat. And, and we can keep masking it and medicating it with other things in our life. We can keep taking a Lubin's cough drop, taking a, a pill here or a drink there, or, or, or dive into trying to fix someone or something and get all caught up in that. Or we can say, you know what, I need a new heart. Much like I need my tonsils removed. We can surrender ourselves to that. So God's been teaching me some things. He's been teaching me some things these last couple weeks. In a season right now that didn't exactly match what I expected things to be. My wife Amy, as many of you are aware, is uh, going through a severe case of depression and anxiety. Um, it's something that she struggled with all her life. It, from, from the time of being, she remembers from the time of being like six or seven years old, having deep anxiety, and then it led into depression later on. And um, for the last nearly three years, though, she's had great peace and a respite. Right? It's like God gave her uh, a gift of, 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 of joy for these, and, and she's been kind of not dealing with that for a long time. And, and we got used to that. We got used to expecting that that's how things are going to be, and we're going to go on like this. And about two months ago, the wheels came off the bus. And for whatever reason, it just kind of returned with a vengeance. And, and it, it's been weighing on, it's been, it's been, it's been a, a, a battle for her, it's been a struggle. And, and there are days when she doesn't want to live. And it's a dark place that I don't know, and I don't understand, and I've never been in myself, but it's one that she... She knows very well, and, and, and she's getting help now, thanks be to God, and she's be getting better day by day, and, and she's, she's seeing, she's, the reason she's not with us is because she's seeking treatment and getting the help that she needs to get through that. But it's been a hard couple months. It's been a hard, life has been hurting for her and for our family. If you're, if you're struggling with depression or anxiety or any sort of mental illness and you're here today or you're listening, I, 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 I need you to hear something today. I need you to hear that you're not alone. I need you to hear that you're not alone. I, I want you to know that you don't have to carry the weight of that burden by yourself. I want you to know that you don't have to carry the shame and guilt of that around with you <coughs> by yourself. I, I want you to know that there isn't a dark place that you can go on this earth or in your mind where Jesus hasn't already gone before you and is already there with you and will be with you through it and will walk with you there in it, even when you don't feel like it. I want you to know that there is no judgment or condemnation here in this place or with God I, I want you to know that I find it to be spiritual malpractice when we as a church and as Christians can raise up a prayer request for our family member who has diabetes and is getting insulin in order to be able to live and yet we feel ashamed or feel like we can't bring it before our brothers and sisters in Christ and say, I'm suffering from depression and I need to take some medicine in order to get through this day. Amen? Amen. I want you to know that this is safe and that there is no judgment here. And where and when that happens to you, where and when that may have happened to you in the past, please hear this. I'm sorry. 
I am sorry that you had that experience. I am sorry that you had been looked at or treated in that way if that ever happened to you in your life. I'm sorry that you've been judged when what you most needed was love. I'm sorry. But I need you also to hear this. I need you to hear this too. Hurting people hurt people. Hurting people hurt people. We live in a world that is fallen and sick. We live in a world that is desperate in need of a Savior every moment of every day. And so, look, we need to move towards healing together, not victimhood. Right? We need to be able to say that, okay, yes, that happened to me, someone said that to me, I didn't like it, so forth, but we're moving beyond that. A year from now, if you're still holding a grudge against the person or the church that hurt you some time ago, then my friend, I have to tell you, the problem is no longer that person, but the problem is in your heart. And we need to get to a place where we can let that go, where we can give that to Jesus. We talk all the time here about how this is uh, not a, a morgue for saints, but a hospital for sinners, a hospital for the broken, where we're getting well. But guys, if we're going to expect the broken and the hurting to come in here, we're going to expect them to hurt us. And uh, we're, we're hurting people. Hurting people hurt people. That's what happens. But we're pointing people to the one who brings healing. I want to share with you what God has been showing me and uh, as my wife's been struggling with depression and anxiety these last couple months. And, and these, if you got your notes with you here, we're just going to run through these quick. There's four things I want you to leave with today. And you can write down what you might hear that helps you or might help someone else. Number one, when, when life is hurting, when things are going bad or sideways in my life, when, when things are upsetting, I learn where my heart lies. I learn where my heart lies. Matthew 6, 21 says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so when, when times of pain and hurt, which are guaranteed to come on our, in our life, for me it, tell, it points me, it says, where, where does my heart truly lie? It's a good time to get recalibrated for me. In the past, three years ago and before that, I used to run to pornography when life hurt. That was my self-medication. For others of you, it's something else. We all have something we run to. And, and that was my coping tool. When, when someone hurt me or didn't live up to my expectations or I wasn't happy, that's how I knew to just escape everything. You'll know where your allegiance really lies when things are bad, when things hurt. But man, you, you know what a great day it is, though, when a big storm comes into your life? And it will be a great day for you, too. One day, a great storm will come rushing into your life. It's guaranteed, I promise it. But you're going to have that moment, that day, where you go wake up and go, Wow, I no longer desire to go after what I used to go after to help me get through this. I no longer go after that. Instead, I'm chasing after Jesus. And my desire for each and every one of you here today is that you would fall more and more in love with Jesus every single day so that when the storms of life hit, you'll know who to run to, where to run. You won't want anything or anyone else but Him. He will be your all in all. And He will get you through safely to the other side. Man, that's such a great day. Particularly if you've been in bondage to something really hard, really tough. And you get out of that and you get freedom from that. Amen. I, I pray that for each and every one of you and for myself. Number two, we need to be moving away from asking what to asking, I'm, I'm sorry, asking why to asking what. Move away from asking why to asking what. Psalm 37, there's a great psalm, there's these these problems happening and life is not going well and the psalmist says commit your ways to the Lord Psalm 37, commit your ways to the Lord life is hard we need to stop asking 
why is this happening to me? And begin asking, what do you want me to do, Lord? What would you like me to do? What's my next move? How can I be faithful in this moment? We can get lost in the wise. And the scary part of getting lost in the wise is that there's no real easy way out because there's never a good answer. There's never a good answer of why did this happen to me. There's never an answer. We're not promised to know why. We live in a fallen world where, where people get sick, where bad decisions are made both on our part and on the parts of others, where people die. We, that's the world we live in. And, and if we get caught up in why, it's really easy to get to that point of, I'm a victim. I don't deserve this. Why is this happening to me? It's not a healthy place to be. It's not where Jesus can heal us and use us. Instead, we need to be looking at what is our next move. Now, that's not to say, though, you can't have your why moments. You can't have that part where you say, God, why is this going on? Get the, do it. I encourage you. Have that big cry out. Right? Get it out of your Get it out. God is big enough to handle it. When, when this all was going down with us two, weeks, two months ago, I was supposed to go on a vacation. And we were, we were going to go on this great trip. I was really looking forward to it. I was excited about it. It was going to be a chance of rest and relaxation for me and my family. And I was, I was so certain that this was what was going to be what Amy needed. And we couldn't go. She was unable to make the trip. And my expectations weren't being met. And I, I went out on the mountains. I, I went to Pocket Wilderness. And God and I had it out. And I walked for hours, screaming, Why, God, why is this happening to me? Why, God? The, the squirrels are looking at me thinking, He's nuts. <laughs> My dog is looking at me thinking, You're off your rocker. But you know, God can handle that. But thanks be to God, I don't stay there in the lot. Eventually I move to saying, God, what? What do you want me to do now? What do you want me to do? And as, as I made that transition in my walk, it was like the heavens opened up. And I'm pretty quite certain that the squirrels started clapping. <laughs> and, and it was like <laughs> and it was like God just saying yes son now we can work with something now we can get somewhere what do you need to do I knew immediately it began just flooding into my heart Chad you need to go home and you need to apologize to your wife you need to go home and tell her that you're sorry for having these expectations of her that she can't meet right now. You need to go home and you need to confess to her that you don't understand what it is she's going through, but that you want to get better at it. You need, you need to go home and you need to love your wife through this storm. And, and when, you're, when, when things aren't going your way, you need to stop looking at her like you're disappointed. And when I turned and I said, God, that seems like a really heavy, or uh, it seems like a lot. I don't know if I can do that. He said to me, Chad, in your weakness, I am strong. And my spirit that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And I will walk you through this. I will not leave you or forsake you. I will get you through this. And you will know that I am with you. And it is me giving you the strength to do what on your own you cannot do. When life hurts, get the why out, scream it out, and come back and say, okay, God, now what do you want me to do? I'm listening. Number three, that's why I need the church. 
I need the church. When life hurts, I'm reminded I need, I need you. I need a team. I need a church. Without all of you, I'm in a boat, up a crook, without a... <laughs> Who are you doing life with? Who are you doing life with? It's a good question to ask yourself. Who, you're do Who are you doing life with? Do, you, do the people that you surround yourself with on a regular basis, do they gossip and, pro and complain, or do they encourage and proclaim? And you can write that down. I like it because it rhymes. <laughs> the people you surround yourself with, do they gossip and complain or do they encourage and proclaim? Do they speak truth into your life? Do they lift you up and speak words that say, hey, yeah, this stinks. Yeah, it's not good. But you know what? I love you. I'm with you. I'm praying for you. we got a God that's bigger than this. Do they encourage you and proclaim good news to you? Now, let me say this. This does not mean that you should only hang around Christians. Okay? Please, God forbid. You all are the salt of the world. If you're a Christian here today, I, I, I want you out there making relationships and developing relationships with people who don't know Jesus and inviting them to church and introduce them to Jesus. But listen, if you're going through a messy time in your life, if you're going through a rough time, there is no harm in saying, I need a break. I need a season where I am surrounding myself with some people who are pointing me to Jesus. i got to do that. i got to take care of myself. We need to do that. That's why every one of us needs to get plugged into a small group. That's why you need to get plugged into a Sunday school. That's why you need to get plugged into our, our small groups, our connect groups on Sunday night or Thursday night recovery. You need to get plugged in or start a Bible study at your home and get two or three people together once a week and start leaning on each other, praying for each other, moving each other in the right direction. We need to do that. We need that. Recovery at Dayton, our open share groups, those are safe places on Thursday night for you to come and you to lay it out and say, this is where I'm at, this is what I'm going through, this is what I don't like, this is, this is where I'm at, just where I'm at. And, and you will not be judged, but loved. You will not be judged, but loved. I got this t-shirt, I'm wearing it today because I love it. Oops, took my ear off. This shirt says, Neighborhood Hug Dealer. And uh, I got it. <laughs> Who's first? <laughs> no, but I got it at, at Recovery at Cokesbury up, up in Knoxville. It's our parent site who's, who's, who's partnering with us for recovery. And I spoke up there, and one of the guys on the front row, he had this shirt. And I said, Man, I love your shirt. And, he, and the next day, he delivered one to me. And, uh, but neighborhood hug dealer. All right? It's better than a lot of things that are being dealt with. Right? <laughs> Amen? Amen? Amen. So um, when you come on Thursday nights, when you come Thursday nights, I want everyone who comes to know that they, this is a safe place where they'll get not just a hug from me, but from anyone in their group that they can share what's going on in their life and just have people say, you know what, I've been there too. Or you know what, I am there right now with you. I'm going through the same thing. Let's walk this out together. And most importantly, you'll come and you'll receive a hug from Jesus. Jesus will hug you. And he'll remind you that he's with you. And that's the last thing. I need Jesus. I don't mess without him. As James, I'm going to come up to play here our closing song. Jesus says, come to me. Come to me, all who are tired and weary and broken. Come to me if you're burnt out, you're stressed out, you're hurting. Come to me, Jesus says. He says, don't, don't run to your favorite fix. Don't run to that thing that you're self-medicating with. Don't run to your Oreo cookie cheesecake. Don't run to your Xbox. Don't run to your online chat rooms. 
Don't run to that person who isn't your spouse or that one who is your spouse. Don't run to your kids, your grandkids, your boss, your favorite novel, your, your bottle or your drink or your pills or yourself. Don't run to all those things which you're medicating life with. Come to me and I will give you rest and peace for your souls. Yeah, life will hurt. Yes, storms will come. It's guaranteed. It is promised. But will you just find me in that storm? Will you come and reach out and I'll, I'll, I'll take you through it? When life hurts, I'm reminded of how much I need to cling to Jesus. And sometimes, thanks be to God, sometimes he, I believe He uh, will allow certain things to take place in my life which wake me up. Maybe I'm on self-control mode for cruise control for too long. And it doesn't take much to say, you know what, I, Jesus, I need you. When I stray away from you, my life is a wreck. I'm a mess. And I want to be in that sweet spot where you are there with me every step of the way, and I know it. He's a constant companion. He's a true friend. He's the lover of your soul today. And if you don't know him in that way, then my goodness, he's here for you today. And he's saying, come to me. I'm here for you. I want to be in a relationship with you. I want to walk with you through every storm you might face in this life. I want to be your friend. You never, ever have to do it alone. As they play our closing song, in Christ Alone, who is the one in which we find our hope and our healing and our strength. Whether you've known Jesus for a long time and you're just needing a reminder, you need him to just revive you today and remind you that he's with you, I want to invite you to come and pray at this altar. Come down here and just be with Jesus. He's here today. Maybe you don't know him today. Maybe you've never given your life to him. Maybe this is the day where a new life begins. A new start happens here. And you can walk out these doors knowing that whatever may come, whatever may pass, the creator of the universe is with me. He loves me. And I am his and he is mine. Would you come today and give him your heart and surrender to him today? Would you please stand? Heavenly Father, thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, move in and through us now. Open us up to receive you and all that you have for us so that when life hurts, and it will, we know where our anchor holds. We know where our rock is. In Jesus' sweet name, amen. In Christ alone, Found. He is my light, my strength, my soul, this cornerstone, this solid ground, burn through the fiercest drought and storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace.
precious blood of Christ. Kill tonight, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to the final breath, Jesus commands my death. sweet name.